So good afternoon. Uh, I think we have enough participants uh, here to start with a little uh, um, housekeeping. Uh, just a few technical aspects before we start our conversation with the artist, Alana Mandelson. Uh, the visual presentation will be best seen on Zoom's standard view. So on the upper right of your screen, click on view um, and, and then click on the standard view. And that should format you properly for our presentation. Um, I think given the, uh, the vagaries of the internet, please know that not only will the entirety of this conversation be available on YouTube, but the presentation of the short video, uh, which will show mid conversation will be as well. Uh, so if you're having difficulty, you will not miss anything. Uh, you can access the video and or the whole presentation uh, uh, after today, I imagine. Um, on that note, two of the uh, most recent catalogs of Alana's with essays by Stephanie Booman and Lawrence Rinder will be available for sale and on PDF at the Jason McCoy Gallery website. Further, after the talk, the gallery will make available a group of Alana's letter-sized paintings at a price of $750 for our viewers today. Uh, we will uh, readdress uh, this at the end of the talk. Uh, one last request, uh, during the presentation, we ask that everyone please keep your audio on mute. Uh, to do so, uh, find the mic icon located on the lower left of your screen. Uh, click on the mic icon to uh, either activate or mute. Uh, your audio is mute uh, when a red cross is seen over the mic icon. Uh, because this is all uh, to many of us, including me, uh, we'll take a few seconds before we start. And good afternoon. Uh, my name is Stephen Ketwalader with the Jason McCoy Gallery in New York, and I'm very pleased to be introducing the artist Ilana Mandelson in conversation with myself and the gallery's director, Stephanie Booman. Before we move on to our conversation with Ilana, I want to first thank Stephanie Booman and Amanda Konishi for not only bringing us together today, but to acknowledge and compliment them for their creative work over this last year and not only keeping the gallery programming alive, but vital. Through their numerous online activities, especially their drawing challenge, where they extended invitations to a broad array of artists well outside the gallery stable to respond to selected poetry and lyric. These responses were then edited and curated into digital exhibitions and archived on the gallery website. In reviewing that archive, and as impressive as it is, more importantly, I think it created relationships and a wider community for us all that would not be possible through the conventional activities of the gallery, especially during this time. During this last year, there are few things that could be more valuable than the dialogue and friendships that Stephanie and Amanda enabled. It provided connectedness and in many cases, much needed financial support to artists well out, outside the purview of the gallery. As impressive as the now 19 editions of the Drawing Challenge and now the newly started Artist Talks, which premiered last December with Marcy Rosenblatt and continues with the next presentation with Balent Zako, it also leads us to compliment Stephanie with her numerous projects, which include the recent publication of Christian Lohr's monograph through Hecha Khans and her continuing publications of Studio Conversations, which five volumes later continue with her upcoming Rhineland Studio Conversations, all published by the Green Box Editions Berlin. In addition, Stephanie's focus on Frederick Kiesler catalog resume is also significant and her invaluable research will I'm sure lead to important exhibitions and continued scholarly research. 
Much of this work would not be possible, but for the support and tireless energies of Amanda Konishi, who also carries on a significant studio practice. Jason and I want to, commun uh, to commend Stephanie and Amanda and acknowledge our deep appreciation. And so a very sincere thanks to you, Amanda, and you, Stephanie, thank you. You bring us all together. Thank um, you. Just a, a, uh, uh, a quick introduction uh, to this uh, format. Uh, we'll start by going into uh, the artist conversation um, uh, with the middle of the uh, conversation, we'll show a, a short video and continue uh, our conversation inviting a Q&A. Uh, please note that comments and questions can be entered through the chat throughout the presentation. And an introduction to Ilana herself. Uh, very brief. Alana Mandelson was born in 1956 in Calgary, Alberta. Uh, Ilana uh, in college studied botany and art and went on to receive a BFA from the Rhode Island School of Design, where upon graduation, she partnered at Artist Proof in Intaglio Studio in Cambridge, Massachusetts. For nearly 40 years, she has been the recipient of numerous grants fellowships and residencies, and has exhibited extensively through galleries and museums. Alana lives and works in Concord, Massachusetts, where she and her husband, David Lax, raised their two children, Eric and Fina. Alana, hello. Hi. <laughs> and there's nobody who's followed me more closely because Stephen and I go way back to artist proof days. And that dates back, uh, I think more than 38 years for us um, and a, a, a deep and entwined history that is. Um, I thought it would be interesting to uh, speak about those formative years and perhaps start the conversation off. Um, I'm very interested in circling back to your interests in biology um, and your interests in nature conservation and uh, specifically uh, one memory I have of a period of time where you were studying uh, the, uh, a very specific landscape to reintroduce uh, the wood bison. Uh, but before we do that, I, I thought it would be a um, good place to start with Artist Proof itself and um, your interests in printmaking, what brought you there and uh, specifically how the technique of, uh, in your case, monotype influenced your painting. Well, the interesting part is the marriage of printmaking and painting. And so, even though I studied every part of printmaking, it was the painterly part of printmaking that really resonated with me, where you actually apply something to the plate and then you subtract it. So it's that adding and subtracting in printmaking, which has sort of carried me over to my painting part. So as I paint, I both add and subtract, both as a way of sort of resonating what happens in nature, actually, which is sort of things get added, things get subtracted. There's always that transition, but also it really comes directly from doing monoprints. That way where you kind of can have, have it and have a memory of it as you take it away. So I think that's where, you know, I, I liked that sort of dance between painting and printmaking, which I think still informs what I do. Mm -hmm. Very much. And so um, did that, that idea of the ghost image in printmaking, um, did, did, does that influence uh, your painting today in terms of the materials you use? Very much so. It, it doesn't, not so much the material as the surface in which I work on. I work 
very specifically on Yupo, which is, or on general. And it's a very slick surface. And it really, um, it's akin to that, that of like a monoprint plate. So the, I'm looking for materials, I'm always looking for materials that resonate and talk about you know what, what what it is I'm trying to paint. So if I'm talking about water and movement, I want material to do that. If I'm talking about things in nature that are growing and then being taken away, I want the material to do that too. I want the material to match um, what what it is I'm trying to talk about. And in, in recent years, you, you moved from uh, oil-based inks and paints to water-based inks and paints, is that true? It is true. I'm now moving back, but at that point I did that um, very much for health reasons, to be very honest. And um, I also have to say, I changed all my materials at that point because I spent so much time when I was doing oil paint getting really there's there's a uh it's got a different materiality to it and when i switched to um acrylic and more water base i had to switch the substrate of which i worked on so i wasn't always saying in the back of my head oh that's not the way it's supposed to behave you know i really could work with that material and respond to it directly and so i switched everything at that point mm. And now actually the last piece that you'll see um, is actually an oil, it's acrylic with oil. So oil is now being reintegrated as, mm. as my ventilation and my health has improved. Mm. So I'm now doing a little bit of both. Yeah. And, and so you're moving to the, the water-based uh, paints was, was not a direct response to the more the qualities of oil and water that one, one could cr create in painting more easily with watercolor? Was that, was that? I think when I switched, I was looking for two things. I wanted it to very much be, um, once again, to have, if I'm talking about water, I want that materiality to be, I want my materials to be able to talk about water and be in that fluid form. And so it became a marriage of material and um, subject matter. Mm -hmm. but I think um, I was using oil paint truthfully in a very fluid way also. You know, I was using a lot of, I think what got, I was using a lot of um, turpentine to get those same qualities. Yeah, that, that is true. Um, but, but of course you are painting on paper now. Predominantly. On UPO, which is a polypropylene, yeah. Mm -hmm. that and that, that gives very specific effects, the, the scumbling effects, the, yeah. uh, we're looking at what we choose now, a detail, those oil and water-like effects, uh, that's more easily achieved on, on UPO. Um, no, I can do that on board also. Mm -hmm. Truthfully, I can do that. Um, you know, I've been doing the last few pieces that I did that aren't here on board and I can get that to also. Mm -hmm. So then why the paper? Is, is it the transparency? It's the transparency, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the transparency and the trans, there's a translucency that you can get mm -hmm. from this, yeah. Beautiful. So, um, I guess one topic of conversation is is the composition of your 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 works, and I guess I would uh, obviously you are so connected to nature, um, but I wondered if you could talk about uh, that memory that I have of as a uh, young field biologist, you were. My memory is that you uh, segmented areas of land 
And to study what precisely? So my very first job was really as a naturalist in Parks Canada. And my job there was to make sure that the bison or the buffalo herd had enough grazing land. And we did that. The Elk Island National Park where I was working had a specific kind of bison or at the time thought they had a specific kind of bison. So we fenced it in. And my job was to monitor small one foot by one foot pieces of ground to make sure that the park wasn't being overgrazed. And oh, okay. I think that taught me two things. One, to look really closely because my job every day was to monitor whether indeed the, these different areas that I had mapped out and charted were being overgrazed. But the other thing on a very visual way, it taught me that to look at things over time. So it wasn't about the, and the, what happened the first time that I counted, it's really what happened over time that I was looking at. So even in my paintings today, it really informed when I look at something, I don't look at it just as it is. I try and read the bigger picture there. I try and say, so if I'm looking at these grasses, then over time, that might be succession and grow into um, a whole field. Let me think about how these things are in transition. And so I'm trying to catch things in nature in that sense of between the, the, the transition from one part of nature to another, because as we all know, nature is about the transitions. It's not static. So I think it's the, that fluidity, it's that space where things are moving from one to the other that I'm really intrigued in and really try to capture in the pieces. So in a lot of them, you'll see sort of things are kind of floating or moving or they're, they're at the beginning of a season and at the end of the season in the same piece because I'm catching it over time. I'm not sitting down at a scene and saying, oh, I'm just gonna capture that scene. I'm, that's not really what I'm interested in. It's more, you know, I revisit these spots over years, as you know, Stephen. Stephen, poor Stephen has been with me to many of these spots and had to carry out logs that I'm interested in, whatever. <laughs> He's been there to carry out many a thing. Well, what I, what I think is, is um, just an interesting train of thought. Um, you know, if you think of 20th century art and I guess most people, your early part of the 20th century would think of the major artistic uh, conceptual innovations as cubism and then I guess surrealism. Um, and I've, I guess in my mind uh, from you know, those many years ago, thinking about you gridding land and thinking about um, the, uh, not the aesthetic, but the, the compositional ideas that you introduce in your, in your painting. Of course, you, I would never come to your work and, and think that uh, they're cubist by any nature, um, but they're, uh, they are organic, very aesthetic, and they are uh, impossible landscapes to see in the world, and yet they're not. I mean, I've, I, um, one of the things that continually uh, gives me pressure, and, uh, pleasure, impresses me about your work is, of course, it is very aesthetic, but that there are these these uh, different uh, ideas, spatial ideas, going on in the work, um, and I somehow thought rather than bison, you'd be talking about geologic <laughs> things moving and coming together, dying and rebirthing. Uh, and I know that is a large part of, of what influences you, but... Um, 
I, I think I think that there's a place where it starts, and I think it started with that way of looking. I think you're 100% right, Stephen, which is, in my mind, cubism has a sense of what you bring to it, not only what you see, but what you know to be on. Right, that is true. On all sides. And when I go to paint, like this painting here that we're looking at, Time in the Mountains, is not only about the observation of one particular spot, it's really about the places that I knew in getting to that spot. It's about the things that I carry with me as I move through time and space. So you would never have all those things in one particular image. And yet, as you kind of the, catch the essence of a space and a place, you carry with you that knowledge and those, those experiences. And in this particular piece, um, I was really talking about different forms of time because this was a piece that I actually did for the White Museum, um, which is a show that went pandemic and got canceled. Um, <laughs> but it was really very much about how, you know, this is an area that tourists come to a lot. It's an area I was born in. It's an area that I revisit every year. So it's like, there's parts that I painted as a tourist would see it. There's parts I painted as I experience it every year. There's a part where it's things that are obliterated because I remember them, but vaguely. So it's, that's sort of the sense of those different senses of time that I'm trying to embody in a piece. That's uh, a good segue. Uh, tell us about your history at Banff. Well, I was born in Calgary, Alberta, which is um, right next to Banff. And I was really lucky, um, to be very honest, because they accepted me into the, there's a Banff School of, a residency program there. And I have, we, I have been accepted three times. So each time I get a chance to kind of explore it from a different level. When I was a kid, I went there and I was so overwhelmed by the mountains that all I did was paint one pebble for an entire month because I just looked at the mountains and went, oh, I'm so sorry. You are so overwhelmingly beautiful. There is no way I am going to get to do that justice. So it really has taken me revisiting and revisiting to even allow the mountains in um, and move them from that little pebble into a whole scene. And hopefully my show there will go on and hopefully I'll, I have another residency coming up. Once again, fluid. <laughs> but, th but that is, uh how this body of work, how your year started, and you, you built up to create, uh, to, to paint this body of work specifically for that exhibition. And um, it would be uh, interesting to hear uh, how you're preparing for that exhibition and specifically to, to paint a show for that space and what that moved you into? Well, the interesting part, and I don't know if Amanda, you can go back to Schumann Resonance a little. Sure. Um, I started doing scrolls at that very, for the show. Um, and the reason I did that is I felt like I wanted to talk about a space and time that you can't see all at once. So these scrolls are quite long and so you can't, you, you can't experience it in one single view. And also they talk about, you know, in a, as a scroll opens in different places and, and you're not sure where you are in time or space. So I wanted, felt like the mountains and that particular environment 
lent itself to a scroll. And the, this particular show is called, sh piece is called The Schumann Residence because it talks about um, a mathematician, uh, Sh Schumann, who developed, he was trying to find out the magnetic pull between the ionosphere and the Earth and came up with the Earth's heartbeat, which is a very low resonance. And it was changing in the mountains as I was doing this piece. So that piece, that's, that's where the name came from. And it's, I felt like the scroll format was perfect for the pandemic. Although when I started the pandemic, I thought I'd be working on one scroll. Truthfully, I thought, oh, I will measure time and the confusion of time and the isolation of time in the same format where you have these kind of, they unfold and they roll up and you kind of revisit, um, of course, to find out that the pandemic has gone on for a lot longer. But mm -hmm. that's where these started from. They started very much about memory and time. And the mountains. And that just came together with the idea of having to paint 20, 30 footers essentially to accommodate this space. Or had it been a thought in your mind for, I mean, had it been, had it been something that uh, influenced your ideas in earlier paintings as well? The, the, this idea of, of a specific measured um, radio frequency? No, I think it started here. And it started here because they were monitoring it and it was changing. Oh, they were monitoring it where? Oh, uh, just There was an area out, out west where they were, they, 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 it was a German Schumann who developed it. And then um, and a friend of mine actually drew it, brought, um, Celia Harris brought it to my attention. And then while I was out there, I mentioned it and somebody said, oh no, we monitor that Schumann resonance. Huh. So I thought, this is, a, this is exactly what I need to talk about. How we, how there is this rhythm that over time and a, and a beat and a pulse. And it, it kind of stretched your ideas about folding in landscapes to each other in the more domestic size painting. Um, truthfully, I think the folded landscapes, to be very honest, came first, where I was still trying to marry different, and still am. That's not, that's always been true where I try and marry different landscapes. It's my way of saying you're not, you're here and here, and this is going to change from here to this. There's that space in between. Um, so I think that's some, that's a theme that has been ongoing. That's not just specific to um, the BAMP show. The scrolls were, the, was the BAMP show started with the scrolls and it was through like this one um, beginning started with the pandemic. That, that's, I started that the, as soon as we, that was the day we, we were told we had to stay inside. Mm -hmm. And that actually coincided with uh, the move to your new studio, just by coincidence. It did. Yeah. Although it's not a new, it's a, it's a room in the house. Um, I moved pretty much simultaneously to the right. room in the house. Yeah. Right. Not quite a studio yet. It will be. Yeah. Well, um, Stephen? I would like to um, insert a question that was in the chat that I think pertains to the scrolls um, in particular. That is, Ilana, do you work from left to right, especially in these scrolls, and do you wish for them to be read this way? You so said this traditional concept, um, you know, that relates to our writing, our reading, or do you have perhaps um, some thoughts about Chinese landscape painting, that there's a Far Eastern mentality, is it more free? Can you talk a little bit about that? That's a really good question. Um, 
when I, I have to be honest, when I started them, I felt they were a story. And I felt like it was a scroll that was a story that was very much from left to right. Um, in the newer pieces, I have been editing out areas. I've gone back to them. So there's areas that I've entirely edited out. And that's um, more about how we revisit things, how we go back to places, how we, what we do remember, what we do forget. So I now am, I started it one way and I would say I'm now doing it another way. I've now gone back to a lot of these scrolls and edited out whole areas, left them blank or made them very opaque. That's my other, that's my, what I'm doing now. It's making them much more opaque yeah. so that they, it really is a little bit of East and West there, both mentalities, but it was started very much as a yeah. story. I wanted it to be a story. And but do you have a director for the viewer or do you leave that free for everyone? I mean, do you, do you have kind of a curated idea of viewing in that sense? No. And the reason why is I want it to be a scroll that you open up and can revisit at different points. Mm -hmm. So um, even though it's sometimes created left to right, I want people to, as, it, as if they want, they can open it at different spots. Mm -hmm. And it's that sense too, for me of, um, Sometimes we don't know where we are in time. We don't know how much time there is, where things are evolving. So it's, it's that unfolding and unrolling that's also a key to that story. There's a follow-up question now in the chat. Um, we should also insert. And um, following up on the East-West idea, how do you think about the space and the composition? I think I, I really think about negative space a lot. Mm -hmm. I think about what is what is left empty is equally powerful to what's painted. Um, and so that sometimes informs the composition a lot because I'll start with saying this I need I need the space to read. I want the viewer to be able to enter here and exit here. Mm -hmm. And I want that vision of how you can move through light and move through dark. So um, I don't know, does that answer that one? I think so. How do you edit with this material, Ilana? Oh, actually it, it's, can I tell you, this material is so much fun to edit. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You just, basically you take an alcohol rag and wipe away before you- It's a completely it. clean slate in that sense. Right, and then you start yeah. again. And yeah. so there's areas where you just, you know, edit out. This one, I, actually, if you're looking at, I didn't edit out that. I just thought of the white space and how I wanted the mm -hmm. water re to read and the marks in the water. Um, mm -hmm. but, but back to the sort of editing, it's, it's, a, it's a very lovely medium in that way because you can, you can go back and forward. And I think for me, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about things over time. So I'm talking about going back and forth. And the material does that. How much do you look at the Yupa while you're painting, while you're in the landscape? Or is that the last step that you're looking at your composition? Because I kind of, in my mind, I see you painting and being so absorbed by everything you're looking at that you're not really going back and forth between paper and view, but you're almost looking and it's almost like this fast, very energetic gesture that's accumulating on your surface. Well, the looking part actually, where I used to always take my canvases and my boards and go out to paint, mm -hmm. I don't do that anymore. Ah, okay. So that was, that was also another thing. I, I, I do my walking. I have a general practice of hiking and walking in the morning. And I bring the memory back. I actually don't bring, there's, I'm not looking at anything in nature anymore. But partly, to be very honest, I have spent years painting in nature, sitting, dragging my paints out, sitting down, painting from a specific site, watching the sun change, 
and you know the wind come up and I so I kind of almost understand that in a very fundamental way and so when I come back from that so like this piece here was painted I it, you know there was a big snowstorm before we left and this was painted from memory not looking mm -hmm. but the hike the whole hike I went on the way the water sort of became sort of the, the ice and the water and that relationship. So I'm not, I am looking mostly at the UFO actually one painting and not so much at the scene anymore. So I'm, I'm very much involved in the process of the material and the, you know, and what I'm painting, like what they, not, what's in my mind, not what's in front of me. Does that answer that one? <laughs> it does. Um, I would like to read one more question right here, Stephen, and then I, you know, I stop interrupting for the time being. But um, Elisa is asking: Early Chinese scroll paintings use mist to change how the viewer moves through the space. Does that idea enter into your process as well, Ilana? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Yeah. There's there's this sort of space that I think mist sort of is the, um, that mis that's the mysterious space where you're, it's when I, when I think about mist, I think once again about the space in between. You're not really landed in one space or another. It's sort of, you're neither dark nor light. You're sort of right in that wonderful in between space and that transition. And that's really, I feel like we're all in transition and we're all that's the sort of metaphor of nature. It's, it, it's always in flux yeah. and moving. So, yeah, good question. <laughs> Very good question. Because I think that's something that I failed to point out earlier is the idea that you are painting from memory from the door, it's not in front of you. Stephen, I'm having a hard time hearing. Oh, but I was, uh, saying is that it was a very good question and that I, I failed to point out earlier that you're painting from memory and uh, you are no longer painting in plain air the way you once did. So, very good question. I bring a sketchbook, but that's just, that's for fun. Mm -hmm. sure. Should we show the video? Thank you. 
Theo brings King Alana into thinking about this last year very specifically with you. Your, uh, your last studio was very internal space. Can you talk up a little bit? Yeah. Your last uh, studio was very internal space. And your studio that you're working in now is a uh, very external space, yeah. flooded with light. Um, and I've, I've, I've just a autobiographical note, which I, I think is important uh, in describing uh, this last year specifically to you. Uh, you had a neighbor that you were very close to um, that um, influenced the work uh, greatly really through his dying. Would you, would, you, would you talk about that a little bit and um, maybe just carry us forward as to where you are working today and um, I think it's a very heartening story. You know, I think it's kind of an appropriate thing to end on and, and uh, maybe respond to. Um, well, actually, to be very honest, I think he gave me permission to move and leave because I was very much, I'm very much rooted in one spot and I feel like I'm hiking place sometimes and look at the same place over and over again. And when Woody died, I, I no longer wanted to be there. <laughs> I just, I wanted to leave. That was the, I mean, that's the simplest way of saying it. I, uh, I left the next day. My husband and I had bought a beautiful house and the day he died, we just packed up and moved the next day. And I think it changed. I now live on a beautiful place right by the river and I think it's the river that has become the metaphor for things that are always moving. You know, cause I, I moved to a new environment uh, and got to look again at how, you know, I, I, I don't remember who said you can't step in the same river twice. Cause basically they were talking about how you're not the same person and the river's not the same. And I felt like by moving to a new environment, I was looking afresh at a whole new place in depth, you know, it, and it changes every day. You know, there's, there's every day I go out and there's something different. So these are all done um, from, no, this part actually, very beginning of the scroll, I'm wrong, was done in the first studio. And then as it goes on, it's done from the new studio. The same, the same piece was done in both places. Mm. So you kind of can see me coming into the water and moving to that from one place to another at the very beginning of, you know, spring. And watching that. But I, I think it's that sort of what happens um, in art for me is it's very much about how I, it's what's my peripheral vision that really affects what I'm doing. So by moving, it changed what I was painting. You know, in the same ways when I was living in New York, I was painting very much about architecture, still about flux and fluidity, but that I was referencing the buildings, whereas now I'm re referencing where I live. Thank you. Stephanie, are there any further questions from? I think it's time to maybe move uh, towards an open Q&A if someone would like to ask a question directly. Um, otherwise, there was a, a couple of things I could address. But, um, 
they don't all have to be typed up in the chat. That was just during the conversation, but I think we should have a few minutes of direct conversation with anybody who would like to, to ask something. I have a question, if I may. Yes, please, go ahead. There's yeah. too many people for us to see anybody holding up their hand or anything like that. So you just have to speak and we have to be <laughs> coordinated that way. Thank you. Hello. Alana, I know you said that you go from season to se or you go back to the same place many times and the way that nature changes is what inspires you. But is there a particular um, season that you find to be more inspirational than others or a particular time? Well, you know, what's interesting is there, I think having studied plants and stuff, there's always like in spring, there's the um, skunk cabbage, which creates that big red. You probably saw it at the very beginning. And I just, I think it's because I've had this edited snow landscape and it's a plant that creates its own heat. So it comes up bright red in the middle of, of that. I just can't wait. And then there's <laughs> like milkweed that comes. And I, every year I just have to revisit that. It's like, I, and what's interesting about revisiting something is you're going, okay, I painted this probably about 50 times. What am I going to bring to it now? That's very different. You know, it's about seeds that go from one place to another. How do I edit that? How do I change that? Where am I differently than um, I was the last year when I painted it? But I, so the, to really answer, I like those transition seasons. I love spring, I love fall. And I actually, I'm a Canadian, so I love winter. It's just summer I can't stand. <laughs> <laughs> Every other season I'm going, yes, this is so exciting. So it's so interesting because you just refer, and you always refer to plants, but there's so much water in your work. So um, can you talk a little bit more about the water and maybe the different ways you look at it? Well, I live literally directly on water. Um, now, and also I really do think it more and more, it becomes, um, it's the source that it's the sort of metaphor of things that are fluid and things that I think I, this is more in my regular life. I think spend a lot of time thinking about sort of what happens to water over time, what happens upstream that affects you downstream. Mm -hmm. How how is it that these things are connected? And I feel like water is the perfect place to talk about that, about those connections and how these how how what happens here affects that. And it it is. Um, I'm obviously drawn to it because I live, we, we keep choosing to live on water. No matter where I go, we are, we're really like we, you know, for a while we live in Sausalito in a, in a houseboat. We always go to water. And I think I resonate with that. <laughs> Thank you. Ilana, you mentioned that you're going to water. So how come you're bringing oil back? Um, because oil does, they're, they're, each material does something somewhat different. And so when you're trying to do, talk about different materials, so the acrylic is very fluid. I can get it to really move, but there's things that I want that oil does that acrylic doesn't. So there's a, it's not about an opacity because you can get it to be, oil, but oil can read multiple levels. There's ways of building up oil that I don't think acrylic does as well. And so I finally said, I miss that. I just miss that layering that I could do in a different way. And so, and I've been playing with this acrylic long enough to go, okay, I get it, I understand it. And I always like to reach out each material brings something different. And I, I felt like, okay, I'm ready to reach out and bring it back in and see what it can do in there too. Alana, 
I have a color question. Hey, Barbara. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have a color question. Is the color seems very grounded in reality. Is that intentional, intuitive? Uh, do you think about it at all? Or is it just how you see it? Um, what, what do you, or have, do you think about it? Very much, and great question. Um, it is grounded in nature because I spent so much time painting nature. Um, so where it's not, it's incredibly intentional, but otherwise it is grounded in nature and grounded in trying to catch that season, that moment in time. But um, there's a few where it's, the color is not um, grounded in nature. It's a very artificial color. And that's very much talking about sort of the editing out or the human part of how we edit out landscapes. Um, which I don't think there's many of here, but I do use specific sort of very, um, I use the nuance of sort of more, more, more um, man-made colors to talk about that kind of editing. Lana, could you talk about scale, your use of scale? Absolutely, these, these you can see are bigger. And because I think there's a physicality to painting large that allows my whole body to work. It's not about a wrist, it's about an entire experience. And I think as in the scrolls, I want people to be able to be enveloped in the piece. I want them to be able to enter into it. I'm really thinking more about the, the relative scale and the mutability of scale in your images. Things can be small and large relative to each other and it changes. Can you say anything about that? Yeah, I think that it has a lot to do with the, um, how I would say it is, it's sort of the emotional impact it has on me. Like they could, some things could be really small, but they mean a lot to me. So they become really big. And I think things that are really big don't have to be because they don't, don't really, they're not key to my experience and to the way I see the world. So I try and have things reflect those, that, that sort of, it's emotional scale, I think, is how I would say it. But that's a great question, Kathy. Well, it's also about a wave can be a huge tidal wave or it can be a little ripple and it can alter depending on how you read it, your state of mind, what it's next to. There's a mutability in the scale, the same way you're talking about mutability of the natural elements. But you give us these little leaves as kind of the scale. The little leaves keep appearing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're not really... In, they're not relative in scale. They're just the things that I think are exciting and interesting in where, where they, and I think they become sort of a sense of, once again, flux and fluidity. Do you, Elia, tying in with that, can you talk um, a little bit more about your brushwork? Um, Kathy just talked about the scale, but you have these abstract passages and then you have these details. Do they happen simultaneously? Do you layer them or are the details coming last? No, no, they, they happen at the same time. Mm -hmm. Exactly, so I'm going near and far and moving from one to the other. They, they all happen at the same time. And so I'll be very much trying to hold the big picture Mm -hmm. while, while I'm creating some detail. I wondered if, as you're sourcing, do you ever take snapshots uh, to look at when you're also looking at your sketchbook? Some of it is very, very specific, and I wonder if you use that means too. I, I actually take hundreds of pictures. Yeah. <laughs> But I don't, I try hard not to reference them when I'm painting. 
Oh, I find that when I use a photo, um, it anchors me too much in a particular moment. Mm -hmm. And I don't want that. I want there to be more of that sense over time. So I do do hundreds of pictures. As most of my friends who hike with me will know, I walk and photograph and walk and photograph. And, um, but while I'm painting, I try very hard not to have any photos around me so that I can very much work from that sense of um, what, what I've absorbed. Thank you. And Alana, uh, some of your paintings to me have an emotional aspect to them. I wonder um, if you could talk to that. Is it a, a something that's consciously done or is it something that you just realize in the work um, unconsciously? I would have to say Painting is a practice that I do every day. And in some ways, it's my language that tells me sometimes my emotions more than, so I can start a piece and go, oh my gosh, am I ever anxious? Um, and I think it becomes, to be very honest, I think it's my mirror. It, it, I can't filter that. Um, it's how I feel and what I see simultaneously. So it's not, there's not a consciousness of that. It, it's just, it's true to the work. It's just has, it's, that's actually how I, I think that's my first language is, is I look to the painting to see sometimes how I'm feeling. And as we're looking at navigating the narrative, I note that um, that is the first reference of figuration I've ever seen in your in your work. It's true. I yeah. live with, you know how I talked about how I look to my peripheral? Well, my ducks and the water are, are not so much peripheral anymore. In pandemic, they have become my community. <laughs> mm. And uh, I wanted to talk about where all the ripples were coming from and why they were moving that way. And um, I have a very large flock of Muscovy ducks and mallard ducks and every other kind of duck that come visit me every day. And I finally felt like, okay, they need to be part of this. Mm. They need to be part of the story of time. And time is uh, very much part of your work. So I think this is a good moment uh, to say thank you. Thank and, you. Paul. Thank uh, you all for coming. That was so lovely. I hope it's been interesting to our audience. And um, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> From now going forward, it's all on Steffi. <laughs> I'm not sure this is my forte, but um, to our audience, uh, uh, we are making uh, a group of works available uh, at a cost of $750 plus a shipping charge. And that's uh, for those watching today. And you can find those on Artsy, Amanda, is that correct? Correct. Um, and just to say, Ilana, thank you. This has been a very nice part of the afternoon to be with you. Thank you, and thank you all for coming. I really appreciate that. Okay. okay.